the story of the birth of Christ, but but it's something that we should we should always celebrate the entire life of Christ and know that it is Christ in us that that is by that spirit that is within us is that that keeps us uh, connected with our Lord and Savior. It's the very thing that. Uh, that is the essence of what we are as Christians, you know. And sometimes we put a little too much emphasis upon this particular season when we need to be seeing Christ as a whole. This is not, Christ is not something we do just on Sunday. Christ is not something we do just, you know, well, once a year we celebrate his birth, you know. Once a year we celebrate his resurrection. Well, those are things that should be in the forefront of our mind at all times, you know. And... Uh, People, you know, people understand that, that December the 25th is just a, a, a date that uh, actually it's a pagan uh, holiday date that was adopted many years ago. Uh, uh, and that's when we began to celebrate Christmas and Christians put their own slant upon this pagan holiday and, and, and made it uh, uh, our celebration of Christ, uh, Christ's birth. Uh, theologians teach us uh, that more than likely Christ was born, they have come up with a date of September the 29th. Uh, I don't know how exactly they come up with that, but they're a lot smarter than I am, and, and they didn't just throw a dart at the board and come up with that. But I believe that's probably uh, more correct than, than what we do. But the idea, the understanding of celebrating Jesus, just who he is, it's something a Christian should be aware of at all times. What what a gift, you know, the, the whole concept of gifts. Again, uh, all all the principal players in, in the traditional Christmas celebration that we have are all offshoots and spinoffs of pagan tradition. You know, and I know this is not a popular message on Sunday, but you're just going to have to, you're just going to have to take truth and chew on it, Okay. Uh, but this is the truth of the matter, and, and, and we put a Christian slant on everything. But, of course, the idea of gift giving was brought about as a result of this, and we give gifts to one another in remembrance of Jesus' birthday. Uh, at least that's the idea behind it. But what a gift to the world that God sent his only begotten son, his only begotten son. He sent him here. That's the greatest gift that's ever been given to mankind. And as believers, we understand that. As believers, we, we embrace that because we know, we know what life was like before Jesus came in. We know what life was like before the salvation experience came in. And what a gift that was to us. What a, what a treasure that was to us as believers to, to be able to walk in the joy of the Lord and to know that we have Christ in our hearts, that we know that we have eternal security with him forever and ever and ever, that that day is coming. It gives us a hope. It gives us a hope. So, so Christ, I mean, excuse me, the Father sent his only begotten Son that we might have that gift. And then Jesus came and he walked some 33 and a half years, theologians believe, about 33 and a half years or somewhere in that general vicinity. And he walked on this face as a man. He walked and he sweated just like you and I did. He, he, he felt the heat. He felt hunger. He felt all the, the physical things that we feel as, as uh, uh, human beings. He, he suffered through all of those things. And he, then he died, obviously, on the cross and died a, a, a horrendous, horrendous death upon the cross, paying for your sins and mine. But before he left, he made a promise. He took the Father's promise, actually, and he made a promise, and he told them that he had to go away, that he could send that promise to mankind. We sometimes don't understand that the Spirit of God, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, an understanding of the Holy Spirit's indwelling power, we don't understand that that's a second gift. You know, I can remember one Christmas when I was pretty young, probably the best Christmas I ever had, I was just drowned in presents. And I remember being young enough and dumb enough that I turned around and I looked at my mother when I got through and I said, is this all? And tears broke out in the corners of her eyes, you know, and I felt about that tall, you know. But, you know, when we're children, we want, we want multiple gifts, you know. Just give me one, you know. Give me lots of stuff, you know. 
I mean, you, you see a kid uh, uh, and ask him what he wants for Christmas, you better have about 10 or 15 minutes because it's going to take a while for him to tell you all about that. But as believers, we have a second gift, and that gift is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We talked about that. We went through uh, uh, the book of Acts last week. We got all the way up to uh, Acts chapter uh, 9. And I want to go back tonight to Acts chapter 2 and read uh, a verse of Scripture here. And then we're going to jump back up where we left off. And we're going to go to uh, Acts chapter 1, excuse me, verse 4 and 5. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. Jesus is saying, I've already told you about this. For John truly baptized you with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Hence, he told the disciples to go. And we talked last Sunday about waiting on the Holy Spirit. So many people who have trouble being baptized in the Holy Spirit will not wait will not be patient enough with the Spirit of God. It's like, it's like everything else in this world. They want instant baptism in the Holy Spirit. And I've seen that happen. I mean, I've seen people come forward uh, so ready to receive, and before I could even lay hands on them, the Spirit of God just fell on them, and, and, and they began to speak with tongues uh, 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 as the Spirit gave them utterance. And then other people will come, and they'll have to tarry for a while. They'll have to stand there for a while to receive that baptism of the Holy Spirit. But that is, that is God's call, that God sends the Spirit when he gets ready to send the Spirit. And he'll send the Spirit when that person is ready. And there's a lot that goes into that. And, I, and I'll come back, and I'm going to preach on that some more uh, on down the road somewhere. Uh, but right now, I want to, I want to go to uh, uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now let's go to Acts chapter 10, verse 44. For a person to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit the first thing they need to understand is this gift is like the other gift, the gift of salvation. It is, it is, when a person comes forward to get saved, how do they know they're saved? There's no, there's no physical evidence other than the fact that they may be, they may be having uh, 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 some tears. They may be having an emotional experience with their salvation. Some people get saved and never shed a tear, and other people just boo-hoo like a baby. You know, uh, I, I cried when I got saved. You know, I'm not ashamed to admit it. You know, I just, I felt God move on my heart. And I felt that, I knew that I had changed somehow. But there was really no physical evidence of that. There was nothing to, to testify to that at that moment. Now, your life begins to testify to that as you go on and you begin to live for the Lord. Uh, uh, just the idea that uh, you have been saved and that Christ has come in, that the Spirit of God is now dwelling within you, that changes that person. But as a believer, when we come forward for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we have to come with that same kind of faith. That's how you received your salvation. No one sent you a, a stamp card saying you were saved. You came, you gave your heart to Christ, you believed. It's as simple as that. That's how you get saved. Romans chapter 10 tells us to confess with our mouth and to believe with our heart. Yes. And so it is with a heart that we believe unto salvation, and we believe that, and that is an act of faith. So when we come forward oftentimes, and I say we, I'm speaking in generalities here, when we come forward to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, we have to come with that same spirit, that spirit of, of being ready to receive what the Spirit of God wants to do in our heart and life. We have to come forward believing that God is not going to turn us down. God's not going to say no. The only reason that God would say no to a person that, who wanted to be baptized in the Holy Spirit is if they were not saved. That's the only requirement for being baptized in the Holy Ghost is to be saved. That's the only prerequisite that has to take place prior to that. And it can take place instantaneously. You can get saved and get baptized with the Holy Ghost all at the same time. I've seen it many, many, many times. And so 
we come expecting, we come receiving the moving and the operation of the Spirit of God. Uh, Acts chapter 10, verse 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them. These are the Gentiles uh, that he's speaking of here. This is, this is reference to uh, uh, Cornelius having come and asked him to come into the Gentile home, which was a no-no for the Jewish people to even associate with Gentiles. But God had already told him that there was nothing unclean, that if, that if he sanctified it, it was clean. And so Peter obeyed that in verse 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, and many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. The gift of the Holy Ghost. What is a gift? What is, when we give something, is this something that's earned? You know, if you give your child a Christmas present, is it earned? Well, we might say, yeah, if they were good, you know, they got something. But you know they're going to get something one way or the other. You know, they, you know that's going to happen, you know. And, 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 and most of the time, some of them are stinkers, and they still get the same Christmas that they would have got otherwise. But the idea of gift-giving, at any rate, is something that all the parents are looking at their kids going, huh, you're hearing this, ain't you? But the idea of giving a gift is it's unmerited. It's, it's something that you didn't earn. It is something that uh, is given as favor. It's usually given, if it's given properly at any rate, it's given out of love. Yes. And the gift of the Holy Ghost is no different in that. It's something that is given uh, re and it's in return for the favor of God. It's something that's totally unmerited, something that is totally unearned by us as believers. And it says here that in verse 44, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. Yes. Which heard the word. Now Jesus said that I have to go away that the Holy Spirit can come. He said the Holy Spirit will not come until I go to be with the Father. And so what we have here is this gift, this, this return of the Spirit is obviously the Spirit uh, of God moving into our hearts and lives and Christ is giving us this not for the purpose of just blessing us with a gift. But the gift was given to us so that we might be able to live with Christ in us. In other words, he's not abandoned us. He's not left us. He's not left us powerless. If Christ had came and, and lived as a man and did everything that he did and died on the cross and rose again and went back to be with the Father, if he had not sent the Holy Spirit, how long do you think the church would have lasted? It probably would have never gotten started. There's no probably to it. It would not have gotten started. It had, had to have the Spirit of God that has allowed Christ to continue here on this earth through the people who believe in him and believe in the resurrection and have faith in what he accomplished on that cross. So everything we have, we get from this gift of the Holy Spirit. It says... Uh, uh, the hell of the Ghost fell on them which heard the word. It's associated with the word. The Bible says that Jesus is the word. The word is, the word is God and God is the word. And so when we hear the word, the word ministers to us. The, the same spirit that is, that is coming into us by virtue of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the same spirit that's behind that word. And that's what opens our heart up to the receiving of that word. That's what builds faith in us. Faith cometh by hearing the Word of God. And so if we're hearing the Word of God, then our faith begins to build, and that's when the power of the Holy Spirit can uh, most assuredly come in and do what it wants to do, what he wants to do. Uh, verse 46, For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God, then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Once again, the Holy Ghost fell. Once again, an evidence. Uh, there's that evidence of speaking with other tongues. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 tells us that there's no, neither Jew nor Greek, that we're all one body, neither slave nor free. And so what that's telling us is that this gift 
is available to anyone, to any believer. Now, we have, we have belief systems out here today that do not believe that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for today. They say that this was just for the apostles. This was something to help the beginning of the church and to help to get the church started. Well, that sounds pretty good, but I, 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 I can't imagine why God would send the baptism of the Holy Spirit and, and just require or just allow that to be given to a chosen few. There's not one shred of evidence in the Word of God that backs up that understanding of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If it was good for 2,000, here's always been my theory. If it's good 2,000 years ago, it's good today. There's not an expiration date on God's gifts. God does not limit his gifts. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 3 that there's neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free. Now, this is, this is Paul talking long after the establishment of the church on the day of Pentecost. And so... If Paul is making this declaration, why would he make this declaration? He would, say, he would say, no, this is only for the 120 that were in the upper room. Would that not make more sense? So the understanding that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not for today uh, is not something that I believe would stand scrutiny of, uh, of studying of the scriptures. I just don't believe, I, I know it doesn't stand up to scriptures because I've studied it uh, day in and day out. And there's absolutely nothing to substantiate the idea that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for a given specific time. It is a gift to the body of believers. And if you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you need to be praying. You need to be asking God, God, open up the eyes of my understanding that I might be able to understand and receive this gift that Brother Mullen is talking about. If what he's talking about is for real, I want it. If what he's talking about is, is the truth of the Word of God, then I need that in my life. Because I will assure you the power and the desire to serve God comes associated with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, people can say what they want. And again, there's denominations that... deny the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I have worked with these people. I have associated with these people. And, and, and a lot of them love the Lord. But they'll tell you they don't believe in this, and they always refer to it as tongue talking or something of that nature. I'd be very careful how I referred to anything that the Holy Spirit does. Not that there's anything wrong with tongue talking, but but just the expression is usually said with a little bit of uh, uh, a disbelief associated with it. But they deny the reality of it. But you let them have a, a loved one that gets sick. And they'll go find them some of them tongue-talking Pentecostals and ask them to pray. Because they know if nothing else, them Pentecostal folks know how to pray. Now, we don't need to get the big head on that. We don't need to get pride about that, but we need to know that there is power that comes associated with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Excuse me. But we need to know that this baptism of the Holy Spirit is something that is given to the body of Christ to benefit the body of Christ and to do that. Here you go, back. Thank you, man. To benefit the body of Christ to accomplish the work of the kingdom of God. The Holy Spirit's not given to us uh, uh, to, to flex our spiritual muscles in front of those who do not believe. Not given to us to show out. It's not given to us for personal gain. It's not given to us for anything other than to accomplish God's will through the body of Christ. If we're all one body and we've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's through that body that God works. And we need to be very careful when we're dealing with people who do not believe this. We don't need to have a haughty spirit. We don't need to have that superior feeling that, well, you know, I'm baptized in the Holy Ghost and this poor old brother, he don't have a clue about that. He's just kind of an ignorant Christian. 
that brother saved, he's saved. He's a child of God. He is your brother in Christ or your sister, whichever the case may be. We need to always keep that in mind. We need to pray for that individual that God will open up the eyes of the understanding that they'll begin to understand these things. And, and, and that's one of the things that uh, uh, the body of Christ has been guilty of. This, the Pentecostal uh, uh, leg, if you will, of the body of Christ has been guilty of being just a little bit haughty about having the power and the understanding and, and, and the knowledge of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We need to be very, very careful about that because, because God does not allow pride in anything, most especially something that is given without merit, most, most especially anything that is given to us out of the grace of God. And we need to understand that if we've been blessed with that, there's an understanding that we've come to in our relationship with Christ that's brought us to a place where we could receive by faith that that the Bible tells us about. And there are people out there who struggle with this. There's people out there who, who I think down deep inside they want it, but there, there's, there's just some things within their past or some things within their teaching that does not allow them to receive by faith. And I think era in teaching is one of the, the greatest culprits about that. I mean, there are people who teach that, that uh, baptism in the Holy Spirit, the evidence speaking of the tongue, is of the devil. Plain and simple. They don't make any bones about it. They say, ah, oh, that's of the devil. Well, that's a ridiculous statement because, you know, uh, I'm not saying that I haven't seen people speak in tongues that weren't of the devil. You know, And, and some of the meanest people I know are allegedly uh, Pentecostal people, tongue-talking people. Amen. And they have a mean spirit about them. And, and so just because they speak in tongue is not in itself proof that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is taking place. If a person's been baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's like the salvation experience. It's another gift of God. It's the power and the desire of God given unto man. It's, it's man surrendering more of himself unto God. And what you will see there is you will see a, a, a more intense service to God than what you saw prior to the baptism. And that's why I know, well, obviously I know it's not of the devil because the word tells me it's not. But if I didn't know anything else... I would know. Well, I know this person, and they're baptized in the Holy Spirit. And when they got baptized in the Holy Spirit, they, they began to give more of themselves to God than what they had before. And you see evidence in that person because that power is now indwelling them, and, and there's an understanding of that power. All of that, a person gets saved, the Holy Spirit takes up residence with them. And the argument has always been, well... You know, you can't divide the Holy Spirit up. You can't give them so much at salvation and so much at another time. You're not dividing anything up. But it's like my wife. It, it, if Candace and I are married and I spend every odd month with her, first month, the third month, the fifth month, the seventh month, the ninth month, the eleventh month, but the rest of the time I'm away from her, then obviously we're not going to have the relationship we do if I spend every month with her. Now, that's, a, that's not the same thing, but it gives you an idea of, of, of the understanding of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean I have more of him, but I do have a better understanding. The gifts of God, everything that God gives us is for receiving. It goes back to the old analogy. It, it, someone give Candace a gift here. food in there, I think. <laughs> I'm going to help her with this gift. When this person brought this gift to Candace, they gave her the gift. In order for her to receive the gift, she has to take the gift. In order for her to utilize the gift, she has to do whatever the gift's designed to do. It obviously, it's designed to please the preacher and fill his belly. And so... <laughs> In order to partake of that, I have to eat this, whatever it is that smells so good in there. Okay, yeah, that makes sense? Yes. The same understanding happens when we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I can have this all day long, but if I don't partake of it, then I'm not going to get any use out of it. 
if Candace had refused it at the beginning and said, no, thank you. My husband's big enough. He don't need anything else making me bigger. <laughs> Running out of belts. If she had refused that, would it make the gift any less real? Would it have been any less a gift? Would it demean the gift in the sense that the gift was not as valuable as it was prior to her receiving it? No, it wasn't. She could receive the gift but never use it. And it would be like a person who is saved who has the Spirit of God in them but doesn't understand the gifts of God, have never fully consecrated themselves to that gift that is within them and allowed that Spirit of God to do what he wants to do in him. If I, if, if I walk around this forever, I can walk around to whatever in here gets stale. It's not going to be utilized. It's not going to be understood. It's not going to accomplish what it was designed to do. It's not going to be able to fulfill the promise of what it was supposed to be. It was obviously cooked with love. It was given with love. It was received with love. And I truly will love eating it. But if I don't eat it, then although it was given with love, although I have it, and I go, I don't know what that is. Something in there, but I don't know what it is. If I pull it out and look at it, and, and I don't recognize, we'll say it's bread, we don't recognize bread as bread, then I don't have an understanding of what the gift is. And so it can't accomplish what it was created to do, what it was designed to do. In this case, uh, God's not created being, but, but the Holy Spirit is, is the part of the Trinity it's always been. He's always been, excuse me. And so if I don't partake of that, if I don't have an understanding of it, then it will never be able to accomplish its goal. And that's, I think, I hope that that helps you to understand the difference between having the Holy Spirit dwelling in you and having a better understanding of it by virtue of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Bible teaches us about the gifts of the Spirit. The gift of, revel uh, the gift of knowledge, the, gift, uh, the word of wisdom. All these gifts are designed to do what? To help you and I operate as a Christian. To function as a Christian. We don't have Jesus walking with us, per se. But we have the Holy Spirit in us. As the disciples had the privilege of walking with Christ, and suddenly he's gone, but he told him, he said, you tear and you wait, and I will send the promise of the Father to you. I will send you the Holy Spirit. I will send you the comforter. Yes, yes. That word, that understanding in the Greek for comforter means another one called alongside of to help. And that other one is another one of the same type called alongside of to help. Excuse me. Yes. That's the meaning of comforter. Another called alongside of, of the same, exactly, and it's the same kind, it's the same spirit that was in Jesus, it's the same spirit, the Holy Spirit is the same. And he's called alongside of us to help. Help what? Help us live as believers. What did, what did Christ do? Christ taught the disciples, the, the Spirit of God, I mean, Christ taught them, he showed them by example, he led them, he guided them, he protected them. He prayed for them. The Holy Spirit does the same thing for us. Amen. And when we get baptized in the Holy Spirit, we have a better understanding of that. We have a better interaction there with the Holy Spirit by virtue of knowing and having that power that goes along with that operating in us. Is that making sense to you? Yes. Excuse me while I drink.
The coming of the Holy Spirit is not only a gift, it's a divine gift. It, you know, it, the Spirit of God came from the Father. And this links the Holy Spirit to the exaltation of Christ. In other words, he had to be dead, buried, and then he had to be resurrected. Then he had to ascend unto the Father before it came. And that puts him in his proper place. Because the Spirit of God is always going to point to Jesus. What did Jesus do? He pointed to the Father, didn't he? You read Jesus, everything he said, everything he did was in obedience to the Father. And so now the Holy Spirit here with us points to your Savior, points to Jesus. Why? Because he had to be exalted to the right hand of the Father before the Holy Spirit could come and be with us. Now understand in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit is there. The Holy Spirit's omniscient. He's, he's always been, always will be. But in the Old Testament, he would come upon them for a period or a moment in order to accomplish a specific task or goal. When Samson picked up the jaw of the ass and began to slay the Philistines, that was the power of God coming on him for that particular battle. Every time he exhibited his strength and his power, that was the Holy Ghost come upon him for that particular moment. But we, when we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, we have that understanding with us 24-7. The Bible declares that every time it talks about someone being baptized in the Holy Ghost, it says the Holy Ghost fell upon them. Just as the power of God would come upon the Old Testament saints, when we get baptized in the Holy Spirit, the power of God falls upon us. Amen. And we receive it by faith. Yes, right. Samson would not have been what he was had the Holy Spirit not fell upon him when he did. He would have just been like any other person. Yeah, he might have been strong. He might have accomplished some things. But he wouldn't have accomplished what he accomplished without the Holy Ghost falling upon him. Now, you stop and think about that. You know the story of Samson. You know how that that whole story goes. Again, the Holy Spirit would fall upon him when it was needed for a specific event or a task or or, or whatever. What is that doing? That's accomplishing the will of the Father, is it not? That's the same reason we're baptized in the Holy Spirit is to accomplish the will of Jesus to accomplish his goals here on the face of the earth, to continue, to continue. The reason, the reason he could not come until he was exalted to the right hand of the Father is so that we would have an understanding that this was a continuous process of Christ accomplishing his goals here on this earth. How many of you know that the body of Christ is what has accomplish God's goals here on the face of the earth. Yes, God can do miracles and he can, he can bring storms and he can, he can literally change the, the current of a river if that's what he wants to do. But 99.99% of the work that God does on the face of the earth, he does through the church. He does through those who believe in him, most especially those who are, have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's where he does his greatest work. Why? Because those who have been baptized in the Holy Spirit understand the gifts of the Spirit. And if you have an understanding of those gifts, just like that loaf of bread, you'll know what to do with it. You'll know what to do in a given situation, in a given circumstance. The power of God can rise up within you at any moment, at any time, and you can bear witness to whatever you need to bear witness to. You can accomplish, you can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens you. He does that by the power of the Holy Spirit through you and in you, and he accomplishes his will through his church. And so it all goes back to his exaltation and his going to the right hand of the Father and basically, we were taking up where he left off. The church took up where Christ left off. He said, greater things will ye do than I have done. Now, has anybody in here ever walked on water? 
Was he talking about us doing greater miracles? No, he was a talk, talking about the fact that we were going to accomplish much through all the years that we're here on the face of this earth until he comes back, we're to continue the work that he started. That's what he meant by greater things. He didn't mean that we would do greater miracles necessarily. But it's the work of the church that has accomplished and it is empowered by the Holy Spirit. If, if you have an engine or if you have a vehicle that doesn't have an engine, you can have a really beautiful vehicle there. You can have all the shiny chrome on it, brand new wheels. Everything look good on it. But without that power to drive that vehicle, again, the work is not complete. That vehicle does not accomplish what it needs to accomplish. Uh, Acts 2, and 32, and 33. This Jesus God raised up, and that all of us are witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you both see and hear. Once again, how do they receive it? How is it poured out? To those who saw and heard. Those who, who, in other words, not only saw, but they believed. The word hear there uh, is given in the sense that they, you know, you can hear something and not hear it. All you husbands have been accused of that. You hear what you want to hear, boy. Yeah. But to hear something means to heed that that you've heard. If you don't heed that that you hear, then you didn't really hear it. You didn't really receive that because the Word of God is true. So we are the evidence of the promise of God. Those who have, have received the Spirit of God within them and who operate with an understanding of that. Uh, Jesus is the one that we know that Jesus baptizes. He's the one that baptizes us in the Spirit of God. When he received his baptism, the Holy Spirit came down upon him and him alone, which made him the full-fledged bearer of the Holy Spirit. And he and only he can be the one who baptizes. John made the declaration, that, you know, I baptize you with water, but there's one coming after me yes. whose shoes I'm not worthy to latch. Yes. And he shall baptize you in the Holy Ghost. Yes. And so the baptism comes from... Uh, uh, Jesus himself. Jesus began what he taught. Jesus began all of those things that we read in the Word of God, and we know how the church was created, and we know the things that he declared, and we know the doctrine that he laid out there. And it is our job, our responsibility. He gave us, he gave us the Great Commission to spread the gospel, to continue this gospel on. In order to do that, there has to be some power involved. The nation of Rome was the longest living government that there ever was. The United States had been the longest government under the same system that there ever was. But none of those have lasted as long as the church has lasted. They all, sooner or later, they all failed. Sooner or later, they all come to a stop. But by virtue of the power of the Holy Spirit, the church has never died. It's never been. The Bible tells us that there was always a remnant. Yes. There's always a remnant that served God. And by virtue of the Holy Spirit, that remnant has been able to carry on the work that Christ started some 2,000 years ago. You've heard it said before that we're to occupy, occupy and to hold the fort, so to speak, until Christ comes back. We know he's coming soon. We know it's very, very near. But we need to be, we need to be functioning and doing uh, that that the uh, Holy Spirit allows us to do. Um, the Holy Spirit 
baptism in the Holy Spirit, again, is something that a lot of believers really struggle with. And I don't know uh, always what it is that, that keeps, but as I said earlier, I believe the biggest deterrent to a person receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit is false teaching. The first thing you need to understand as a believer that if you believe the Word of God, then you need to believe the whole Word of God. You need to believe all of it. There's popular teaching that certain things were only for those days. And I know I'm kind of recovering some territory here, but I want, I want to make this very plain. There's absolutely no evidence in the Word of God to back that statement up. There's not one thing in the Word of God declares that these things were for 2,000 years ago, but not for today. And I know the scriptures that are quoted sometimes, one of the scriptures is that uh, tongues shall cease. Well, if you read that, that verse of scripture a little further, you'll read what else it says there. It talks about knowledge and those things. And if, if knowledge is going to cease, then we're all going to get pretty dumb pretty quick. And so again, they take scripture that is out of context and quote that scripture leaving off the first part of that and leaving off the last part of that the understanding there and the teaching there is trying to tell us that when we get to heaven these things shall cease when we get to heaven we won't need language anymore we won't, and, and I thought well what a great gift that will be no more English class you know, my grammar is not everything that you would probably want in a pastor, but that's because I hated English when I was growing up. I hated that class. I didn't hate English. I just hated the work that was involved in that. And I probably regretted that more than anything. But there's nothing in the Word of God to indicate, to prove, to even, to even shadow the idea that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was for 2,000 years ago and not for today. Absolutely none whatsoever. But the Word of God has much to say about the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Amen. And once again, too many people come forward for the baptism of the Holy Spirit with nothing but a thought of, well, I've got to go down there and speak in tongues. Amen. If that's your goal when you come down, more than likely you won't receive because you're not really understanding what you're doing. What you're doing is you're coming to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The evidence of that will be that you speak another tongue. And so what we do is we get come down for the baptism of the Holy Spirit and, and we begin to think, okay, you know, uh, I sure hope he fills me with the Spirit of God. I, I sure hope I don't come down and not receive this time. And, and I know how that feels because I've been there. Okay? I went down several times and I had the same understanding. I went down with the understanding I got to go down there and speak in tongues. Well, I didn't really have an understanding that I'm going down there to receive something and those tongues are not going to be what I'm receiving. What I'm going to be receiving is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the evidence of that is going to be that I speak in tongues. Amen. And so we get our cart before a horse and we come down trying to speak in tongues, trying to, to force that somehow. And we don't accomplish what we come down for. Once again, you come down in faith, believing, trusting God that if he's not going to promise you something he's not going to fulfill. And as we come forward, we come forward to receive. Focus on receiving. Focus on accepting that gift. When the part of the experience comes to speaking in tongues, the Bible says that we come to a place, we will feel the Spirit of God upon us. We'll feel the Spirit of God moving. And we speak that language in another tongue. That means nothing other than a language that we don't know. Now, when you come forward for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, unless you speak it, you're not going to speak in tongues. Well, if I speak it, it's just something I'm making up. No, you're speaking in faith, 
expecting God to give you the words to say. Well, it's just what I made up in my mind. If you come in faith and you speak in faith, you're speaking what God has given you to speak. Yes, you're go- it's, it's going to formulate somehow or another in your mind. If, if I teach you Spanish, and I can't teach you Spanish because I've tried to learn it, and I'm just too, I'm not even better at Spanish than I am at English. You may say, well, maybe if you learn English, you could understand Spanish better. I'd love to be able to speak Spanish, it's a beautiful language. But if, it, but if I teach you, if I could, and I, and I taught you Spanish, you would still have to formulate the words in your mouth. You would still have to speak them, would you not? And if I taught you, you would understand, okay, I know what this means, and you would speak that by faith that you, I know what Spanish means. I know what this word means. It means whatever. I don't even know enough words. I can't even count to 10 anymore. You know. But you would speak that knowing that that was Spanish, would you not? Amen. When we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you're speaking in an unknown tongue. Yes. That's a tongue you don't know. Yes. And so what you do is you speak what God gives you as if he was teaching you the language. Amen. Well, I don't have an understanding of it. If you had an understanding of it, it wouldn't be tongues. Right. It's an unknown tongue. Yes. Now, don't confuse that with interpretation of tongues. I'm not even going to go there right now. That's not what we're talking about. That's a different gift for a different function. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is that person speaking what God... It's as if God is teaching you a language. I don't know if I've ever heard that taught that way, but I believe that's true. You're not, you're not learning it in the sense that you know what it means. But you're speaking it in the sense that God's given it to you. And if you speak what he gives you, then you're speaking in an unknown tongue. If you were speaking in Spanish and you didn't understand it, you'd still be speaking in Spanish, wouldn't you? I give you an example of that. The church we were in before, a man stood up one day and he gave a message in tongues. Another person interpreted, interpreted, excuse me, the message. There was a Spanish person there. Neither one of these people knew Spanish, by the way. Neither the speaker nor the interpreter. But there was a third person that spoke both Spanish and English in the congregation. He said, the person who spoke in tongues spoke in perfect Spanish. He said, the person who interpreted interpreted what he said perfectly as if he understood him. He didn't understand him. He was... Inspired by the same spirit that made him speak that, the same spirit made him interpret that. Now, take Spanish out of the equation. Let's say a language that nobody knows anything of. If you speak in faith, just as that person did, that person didn't know he was speaking Spanish. He did not have an understanding of Spanish at all. Neither did the other one. But he spoke that language... By faith. It's the same thing that takes place when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit. You speak whatever it is by faith. We're always worried that it's going to be us. Yes, it's going to be you. It is, and I'm not making light of that. I mean, people really don't understand that. They think the Holy Spirit's going to come in and somehow or another take over their tongue and speak for them. Now, I have seen people who get baptized in the Holy Spirit and their tongue just begin to just babble a little bit but eventually they begin to speak in other tongues and and the thing that that is a little bit frustrating to me is that a lot of times especially in this church even when we get refilled in the Holy Spirit we'll come forward the Spirit of God will move upon someone I'll lay hands upon them and pray for them and I know the Spirit of God is there I can feel it I can see it on them I can see their countenance I, I can, can't see the Holy Spirit per se but I can see that the Holy Spirit is on them Amen. and they'll speak in tongues for about 10 seconds Amen. and then they'll cut him off yes. if you want to be refilled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit you need to allow him to do what he wants to do 
And we talked a little bit about this Sunday, about sometimes we don't want to tarry long enough. You know, if you're in a hurry to get baptized in the Holy Ghost, in all likelihood, God's going to say, I'm sorry, I don't think you're, I don't think you're ready spiritually. Right. And that's okay if you're not. Because if, it, if it's something you've only got a few minutes to do, you know, it's not likely to happen. And so the baptism comes to those who receive and those who tarry when need be and those who obey. What do you obey in? You obey what God tells you to speak. And you speak it out. And, you know, and, and, and oftentimes, and, I, and I've seen the evidence of this. I've just realized this, but I've seen evidence of those. Those who speak it on out, yes. boy, they get a feeling. Yes. And you have those that almost as if they're ashamed that they're speaking in tongues, and they'll, they'll just barely murmur. I have to just get down there and just, you know, say, hey. Because I can't tell if they're speaking in tongues or not. You see, the evidence of speaking in other tongues is not to prove anything to anybody other than you. You say, well, in that case, I ought to be able to say it very softly. If, if, if you're ashamed of God, if you're ashamed of him, then he'll be ashamed of you before the Father. You want the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Speak it out. I mean, well, what if it's not me? If you go down there asking God for the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you speak in faith, it's not you. It's God that's giving it to you. Receive it by faith and speak it by faith. Take it by faith and walk in it by faith. Amen. Quit, quit mealy-mouthing around in this relationship with Christ and make up your mind whether you believe that or don't. You're either, you either have a Pentecostal understanding of that or you don't. It's okay that if you don't, but you're missing out on the greatest second gift that was ever given to anybody. Amen. If a musician should come tonight. The Bible tells us that we need to be refilled. That does not mean we have lost the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Once you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you're not going to lose it. You may, you may backslide and go into perdition, and, and you may not have the functioning of the Holy Spirit anymore. But you're not going to be able to lose something that God has given you. He's not going to give you this gift and then him take it back. You may forfeit it. If I give that gift back to the person that gave it to us, then I forfeited that gift. It's not that person's fault. It's my fault. And so we need to have an understanding that what we receive is there. And we need to be refilled. And the refilling is not because we've lost it. But it's like a renewal of the spirit that is within us. And so tonight, on Christmas Eve Eve, I want to offer you the opportunity to come forward and be baptized in the Holy Spirit tonight. Amen. If you've already been filled in the Holy Spirit, give you the opportunity to be refilled in the Holy Spirit. There's nothing to fear about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Not something that's going to bite you. It's not something that's going to harm you. It's something that's going to enhance your relationship with Christ. Strengthen your relationship with Christ. Amen? Amen? Praise God. Is there anybody here tonight that you've never been baptized in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other terms? If that's you and you'd like to be filled, come forward tonight. Anybody here? You have to be ready. You have to be ready. 